So here we are. First observation. I'm going to start with a lot of stuff that you know and understand. But all systems are never stronger than the weakest element, and the, uh, they're never simpler than the most complex element, but they're always more complex than the most complex item in, in the chain. Um, and, and those are things that uh, just happen, uh, and we understand why, but people overlook them. So here we are. Our systems are not getting easier to characterize, uh, they're not getting easier to control, and they're not getting easier to understand. Um, complex systems never get any simpler, but the simple systems always get more and more complex. And what intrigues me is how you can get very, very complex behavior from apparently very simple entities collaborating with each other. And as an engineer, as a scientist, I need to understand what is happening, but that facility is actually being taken away from me and you by complexity. We are building systems now, we get surprises, it's called emergent behavior, and we do not understand what is happening. So here's a primary example. The rules of this are extremely simple. These are starlings, this is murmuration just off this coast. It's quite spectacular. Um, there's no central organization here. It's just a bunch of independent bird brains, if you will, acting in an organized way to create this. So here is very, very simple systems acting together to create a very complex outcome. In contrast, this is a bad weather day in the UK and this is the result for the air traffic control, which is very, very complex to create essentially very simple outcomes. We do know we can entirely remove air traffic control. We don't need them. The pilots will actually self-organize and they will do it better than air traffic control. But nobody's willing to give it a go because we don't know how to make the transition. We do know that this works, people don't die, and the worry is there's a snafu when you take air traffic control out and it all goes badly wrong. It's a worse problem than changing from left-hand drive to right-hand drive on the roads. But we do understand. So this is a series of breakpoints. The simple systems and the complicated systems, we can specify, we can be sure of what the outcomes are going to be. We build them top down and they tick all of these boxes. Where we're headed and where we largely are now in a world of complexity which builds bottom up just like mother nature and all of a sudden we lose sight and control of everything. We can't predict the outcomes and we get surprises. Uh, that's a kind of worry. Worst of all, in most systems, we can no longer exhaustively test them. So when I was a young man and I joined the telephone company, it was possible for one human being to understand from top to bottom the entire process and all the mechanisms of making a telephone call from one side of the planet to the other. That is no longer the case. No human being understands how these work. It takes teams of people to muster that understanding. And this is slightly worrying, uh, but like most life forms, um, technology is not uh, nasty. It doesn't do bad stuff. It's not out of control. It's not turning upon us. And so this is the big trend. Um, we're going from, when I was a young man, all this stuff was well understood and designed. Mathematics, the laws of physics were the tools. We knew about the combinatorics. It was handleable, we, and we knew everything, more or less. It was, certainty was the norm, and it was all highly predictable. And now, I find myself over here, where everything is evolving. There's a big knowledge uh, map, uh, gap. We, we're out, definitely out of control. Uh, 
we're, we've got simulations and emulations which are totally incomplete. They do not allow us to comprehensively test. So a good example of this is in the games industry, the online games industry, the way that they test their software is to put it out as a beta and they go to youngsters in the second and third world and they offer them 25 bucks if they find a software bug. And can you imagine when you've got millions of dollars running on an engine, the last thing you need is a software bug that allows someone to drain all the money out. Now, the parallel to that is we've got a situ similar situation in healthcare and security and, and everything else. So this is sort of uh, quite serious, uh, but fun. So this is our world too. I came into an almost 100% analog world. In fact, I did analog computing. And now everything is dominated by digital. Uh, we've got a lot of hybrid analog digital systems. Uh, a good example is us with a computer. Um, but quantum computing, uh, you won't see this in any papers or books, but quantum computing uh, starts to bridge very nicely uh, the digital and the analog domain at the same time, which is what we do as, a, as a, an animal. We, we bridge that gap, uh, that capability. And so uh, everything is accelerating and uh, everything that we make and the machines make um, are totally vital. We, we can't survive without the systems we've got. It's exactly like a ratchet. Once you've got something and you use it, you can't give it away. So people will go without food rather than get rid of their mobile phone. They'll certainly get rid of their TV set in preference to getting rid of their mobile phone. And so the dependency builds up and uh, we can't go back. So um, one of the first surprises to me on, on my undergraduate course, um, fortunately I did mechanical engineering uh, as well as electrical engineering and electronics and a lot of other subjects. Uh, I, to my great delight, I found that the equations here for this transmission system actually match the equations to this electronic system. So something like a flywheel, for example, is a capacitor, it's a, sto uh, a storage of uh, energy. Um, these uh, dash pots, these dampers, uh, they turn out to uh, be like a capacitor resistor combination. They slug uh, the movement. And so uh, you can think of these as a, a low pass filter and so on. And so the equations are identical, but instead of voltage uh, and current, uh, you, you, you're looking at uh, energy uh, changes, forces and torque. So that's really quite nice. When I look uh, for other places, this by the way is uh, salt crystal dissolving into water, but even in the area of sociology, I find uh, great similarities um, in, in the behaviors right across the board. The equations are not the same, but the models are very much the same. So when I look at um, things like social networks or the Internet of Things, I see behaviors that uh, are a bit similar to this. When I go in and look at security and I look at malware generation, I find that we've got an evolutionary process because they're using uh, artificial life. Um, so I'm now going to classify the systems uh, like this. It's within the gift of everyone in this room to conceive of this as an idea and then go out and actually physically build it. You will understand it fully. You will be able to characterize it fully. It will do what you expect and it's relatively easy and straightforward. And so this is the simplest of systems. A bow and arrow would be another example where everybody could go into the forest, chop down a sapling and make a bow. It's easy to do and you will understand it. Mostly you will feel the forces. You won't be able to calculate them if you go back into the Middle Ages, but you will be able to uh, get by. Now a little notch up and uh, we can all actually understand how these work. It's not rocket science. You just have to know 
a little bit about uh, the ionization of gas and a bit of electronics, and you can grasp all that. The reality is, to make one of those, you need a team. And so this is uh, a little bit um, beyond the, the capability, generally speaking, of one person. And so um, these are all top-down designs. This, you need quite a team to do this. Uh, just growing the turbine blades is highly specialized. The, the blades are pulled from a single crystal of metal. They're hollow because they operate the blades way beyond uh, uh, melt temperature and they pump oil through or coolant through to keep the blades from melting. So it's uh, the people who do the, the fuel and the combustion chamber and all of that stuff are highly specialized and skilled people. But it's within the grasp of the human mind as a collective to actually design and build one of these. The maths sort of mostly works. Laws of physics do apply. Uh, we have to use some unnatural materials. And uh, computer modeling is an absolute necessity if you're going to get the very best result. And so this is a, a complex to, a complex system. So this uh, is long range radar. He's looking uh, up to the horizon. He's got roughly 20 second, seconds from spotting a, a, a sea skimming missile two meters above the uh, top of the waves, traveling at uh, near on 800 miles an hour. And he's got to actually then um, flip onto the, the near end radar, the small dish localize something that is about the size of a dinner plate or a, a tea plate coming towards you at 700 miles an hour, then put up a wall of lead and destroy it. Um, how many, I have to ask this question now, it's kind of fun, how many people were alive when the Gulf War, uh, not the Gulf War, the, uh, uh, the war with the Argentinians was uh, on the go? Yeah, so there are a lot of people here who want. I had this experience the other day with a class and they didn't know about the Falklands War. But there was a bit of a tragedy um, in that one of the British warships uh, saw a missile coming. It was an Exocet, it's a French missile, it's NATO. And so the system on board the ship said, that's a friendly uh, missile, ignore it. And the missile kept coming and took out the whole ship. And a lot of people died. So these are the kind of human snafus that occur. It's not the system's fault, it's people overlook that kind of thing. Uh, now, in the industry, when people sell systems, they put an off switch into the system. So a friend today may be an any tomorrow. And so if you sell somebody a missile system and they turn out to be an enemy tomorrow, you remotely turn them off so they can't use them. So that, uh, that wasn't uh, the case. So here's... Uh, Another system, this, this sort of intrigues me. Um, this machine is built from essentially linear components that are fully characterized, dimensions, and understood. There are thousands of them. And when you glue them all together, the machine starts to exhibit nonlinear, unexpected behavior, and there are emergent properties. And so this is something that happens uh, when you have systems on scale that are both simple and complicated. They start to become complex. And so this is what we are. We are a complex entity built from essential components. Human cells are fairly predictable, but when you put them together in their billions, you get us, and we're highly unpredictable. This is a new category. When I, when I first came into systems, this category didn't exist. The machines are now designing and building machines. And so they do it in a different way. We, uh, we start at the top, and we work our way down methodically and the machines start at the bottom, and they clumsily find what works and bubble up. Uh, this is uh, Mother Nature, uh, but in silico, and uh, she uh, has been doing it for billions of years, and we have the advantage over her 
in that our machines run billions of times faster than her evolutionary capability. So we can uh, breed software. I first started doing this um, about 25 years ago, and I came up with uh, this algorithm which I, th I thought was super. Um, but I asked the fundamental question, what would be the optimum number of parents to create the smartest child? And so we started uh, with problems like the traveling salesman problem, the knapsack problem, and all the standard mathematical problems that were taking supercomputers at the time. And in the end, I could do them on my laptop faster. And we were able to transform the mobile network by applying the traveling salesman problem in real time to the routing of um, uh, traffic. So here's the algorithm. Um, some people get upset about this. This is in machines. Uh, I am not being a god, but I am assuming godlike powers in that I make all the decisions. So it goes like this. Let's start with 10,000 parents coming together in a giant copulation and we will neglect the mechanics of the job. Okay, quite simply. Now there are some insects that have nine or 17 uh, sexes. Uh, they don't all copulate together, but instead of having the gene mixing mechanism we enjoy, the gene mi mixing is done by the number of pairs that come together. Okay, so we have 10,000 of the parents come together and a child is created from the software and the child has a goal at the problem. If the child is worse than any of the parents, you shoot that child infanticide. If the child is better than a group of the parents, you shoot those parents matricide and then you put the child back into the population as a parent incest. Bingo. I mean, that's just about all the moral codes of the world destroyed, but in the software world, it works. And what happened was quite miraculous to my mind in that we ran this cycle for between 30 and 35 times, and we always came down to the same answer, that the optimum number of parents for the class of problems we were looking for was four. And I had bet the team that it would be three on the basis I thought it would be a natural number like E, and I thought three would be another, and so it cost me a pint of beer for about 40 people. Anyway, it was, it was a kind of revelation. that One, this actually worked, and two, it took the lid off the freedoms that we might use to create uh, new systems and software. Since that time, things have moved on. They've become a a tad more sophisticated and now uh, the dark side of the force is using this mechanism uh, for creating malware. So the malware you're being hit with is coming out at a heck of a rate, not because they've got thousands of people churning it out, because they've got artificial life producing it. And every now and again, the product is a real good one and they, it gets let loose. So um, a, a property that's not generally talked about in lectures like this, but some things are conditionally unstable and some things are conditionally stable. A helicopter is born and wants to kill you. You take your hand off the rudder bar, sorry, off the joystick or, or, or the controls, uh, you take your feet off the rudder bar, it will go straight into the deck. You have to control it all the time because it just wants to end your life. This thing, you can let go of it and it will come down nice, straight line, it's well behaved. And the, the only time there's an exception to that is when you get a fixed wing aircraft into a flat spin and you've gone into uh, an unstable zone and you can't control it, it takes a lot of skill to get it out of a flat spin. And this actually applies to a lot of our systems. I like conditionally stable stuff. I like to feel comfortable, but some of the things that are emergent turning out to be conditionally unstable, and we have to find those and weed them out because they do uh, have inherent uh, dangers. Now I'd like to clear something up because there's a conceptual problem with the word linear and nonlinear. So most people say, ah, this is linear, a straight line. Absolutely correct. Um, 
what goes in comes out proportionally. Um, something like this blue and red line, what comes in and out is not proportional, but it is the same every time. It's always the same. The non-linearity that uh, I am talking about, I'm now going to just bring up on the screen. And what the problem is, is you put an input in, and every time you put the same input in, the output is different. And that's what I mean by nonlinearity in this case. So, uh, practical demonstration. So, uh, I asked Paul here um, if he wouldn't mind doing something, and off he goes, no problem. Uh, he comes back, and I give him half a bottle of whiskey, and then I say, will you do this for me? And I get an entirely different response. Okay? because his condition has been changed. That's what actually happens in systems. When you get a system and you get it to do something, there are, most of our systems, computing systems, have got memory. So the action of doing something affects the memory and it therefore impacts on the transfer function of the system. So no two outcomes for a given input are ever the same. Um, this is a bit of a challenge. So that's uh, a different level of uh, nonlinearity uh, th than you would find at uh, A level. And again, it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, I think a lot of uh, lay people fondly think that this is how the world works. Not anymore, it doesn't. Um, there are many examples. Um, Three Mile Island. Chernobyl, for example, where we really have to get, had to get people out of the loop. They, uh, they start playing. So in the Chernobyl case, it was actually the guys, I guess, were a bit bored and started playing. So um, when, uh, when I was uh, an engineer in the tele telephone industry, we used to have a saying, in each switch site, we need a man and a dog. The man feeds the dog. The dog keeps the man off the equipment. Once you get people into the loop and they get a bit tired and a bit fed up and they want to play, playing with a nuclear reactor is not a good idea. And not being smart enough, in the case of Three Mile Island, to fully figure out what was happening and making the wrong decisions uh, leads to, to failures. So I've tried to characterize all of this. Um, this is our reality now. In a simple disconnected world, we can address problems in isolation and the solutions mostly work. In a complex network world, that's no longer the case. So we have people out there in every domain, science, engineering, politics, companies, dreaming up simple solutions to complex problems. And there are lots of these, but they're all wrong. They may, be, they may hold for a little while, but they're all dangerously wrong. So these are the, a couple of the tools, but the big data, small data, and all of that stuff um, presents us with major, major problems um, in terms of our ability to engineer. So this is actually a big worry because this is what's happening. Present a population with a problem or a proposition the vast majority of them will hurtle off on the obvious path and a very few will actually recognize that it's more complicated than this. So this morning, right out of the blue, I had a phone call from uh, Scottish uh, TV and I did an interview and it was about driverless cars and I found myself in an arm wrestling contest with people that are not so engineers, not scientists, have never done anything in their lives remotely con uh, connected with systems, arguing vigorously for their case on the, bo bo on, on the basis of total ignorance. And I was trying to explain to them some of the simple concepts which they were not very receptive to. Um, this is uh, kind of difficult. Uh, so I, I found this wonderful cartoon and uh, I thought it uh, sort of highlights uh, what is actually happening. Uh, people are hurtling off the cliff because they think they're making the right decision, but they've not got the tools uh, to know any better. 
And so this is, this is a, a very uh, interesting uh, uh, sort of time. Has anybody here read any of Asimov's books, science fiction books? No? Yeah, well, a lot of people haven't. I mean, it's, it's sort of interesting. Um, if you ask students, uh, have, you, uh, have you seen 2001? No, what's 2001? Uh, it, it's like asking uh, people, have they read all the classics? Uh, I read just about all the classics by the time I was 22, and uh, then I decided there were only basically between four and six stories in the world, and I didn't have to read any more stories. So I just... Uh, save myself a lot of time. But um, this is uh, writ large now in the United States especially, but it, it's spreading uh, worldwide um, uh, and it's really quite uh, uh, disturbing. So let's, uh, let's just get to it. I, I'm not going to throw this evening a shed load of mathematics at you. How many people have done calculus here? Okay. How many people uh, um, heard of the Fourier transform or Laplace transform. Um, Fourier was uh, quite a guy. He, uh, he came up with his transform uh, studying the heat flow along bars. Uh, and then it got uh, waylaid by the electrical engineers and the electronic <coughs> engineers. And it's a magic tool. It allows us to flip between uh, the frequency and the time domain. And here is the single biggest... Uh, Oh, let's, I got another question. How many people did logarithms? How many people know why? So, uh, that's, fairly, that's a lot better than the average audience. I ask uh, mature audiences this question, and all the hands go up, but nobody knows why. Um, the, the, uh, the principle is this. Um, with the logarithm, you can take a very complex problem, multiplication and division, which we are not very good at and you transform it into a much simpler problem, addition and subtraction, which we are good at. And this was uh, around about uh, 1615, uh, John Napier uh, came up with this. And having once created the logarithm tables, it was done for all time. And uh, I'll give you another indication of my age. I did uh, all my education up to university on logarithm tables when I graduated to a slide rule. And uh, we had a mainframe in, uh, I was in Nottingham, the mainframe was in uh, Manchester. So it, it's sort of interesting scalar. This is the same problem. It turns out that we want to work in the, a lot of the time, we want to work in the, in the uh, time domain function of t, but it involves really tricky convolutional integrals that in general cannot be solved. However, if we go to the frequency domain, they turn out to be multiplications which we can almost entirely do. And there is uh, um, uh, another form of transform by Laplace, and its sole property of interest is that it makes the integrals converge. So the Fourier transform is for continuous signals. Laplace tends to be used for transient signals, period. So if ever you get to uh, need this and you can't understand the books, track me down and uh, we'll have a little fun. So this is uh, what's real here. In this universe, there are only three things of importance. Time, space and mass. There's nothing else. The frequency domain is a mathematical fiction, as is the phase domain. So the frequency domain tends to be used for analog systems, time domain tends to be used for digital systems, and the phase domain tends to be used for control systems and for filter design. And, um, and so people actually think that the frequency domain is real, and it isn't. It is just uh, a fiction. And so uh, you'll see that the Laplace form is uh, the sim pretty similar, and that term S uh, has got a number here, this number here, that actually forces the convergence when you integrate. And uh, basically that's all there is to it. But to understand it, you need a big wet towel that you wrap around the top of your head and you sit in a corner for a few days and eventually the penny will drop and you'll see how powerful it is.
and there's a digital equivalent and that's it. So all you have to remember is that that uh, integral sign gets changed to a summation uh, sign and the continuous function becomes a discrete function. And there are things in there that you have to know about like the sampling theorem and final value theorem, all that sort of stuff. It's not rocket science, but it takes a little bit of effort to get that on your wing. So I'm going to proceed on the basis of pointing out that this simple system can cope with all of these different things and all that changes is the form of the stimulus, the transfer function and what we actually see coming out. That's the simplest system you can create. There's not many of them, but they, they do exist. And so very quickly what we discover is that um, order five is a killer. If we get polynomials out of that system, really much beyond two, beyond, up to order two, we can get pretty good results. Order three, they're getting limited. By the time we get out, they're so limited by order five as to be generally useless. And so then you finish up bringing in computers to simulate the situ situation because we don't have the mathematical framework to, to, uh, to, cope, to cope with it. So another feature of this is um, very often, the output feeds into the environment in which the input is living. And so you get this feedback loop that the output in fact influences the input. And on sy some systems, the output changes the transfer function, i.e. it might have some memory. And so this is now uh, getting close to being a stochastic system it's incredibly complex, not easy to deal with. And then we deliberately do something very similar in that we employ feedback to create stability in this loop or instability in this loop by putting positive feedback in. We get an oscillator, negative feedback. We get a very flattening and uh, stable system. And we use feed forward to check out noise in the system. So a good example of that is if you've got a precision power supply and there is any ripple that creeps through, you take a part of the input, feed it to the output, invert it, and you can dampen the noise to zero. So that's it. That is it. That's what happens. After this, it just becomes much more complex in terms of the number of these we can catenate, the number of inputs and outputs. And so uh, <coughs> we rapidly go uh, from this very simple situation to something like this. So in the military domain, uh, I have worked on systems with hundreds or thousands of inputs and hundreds or thousands of outputs. Combinatorially, it is fundamentally impossible to set up all of the test possibilities, driving it at the front to see what happens coming out at the back. You just can't do it. And so you have to uh, do things like Monte Carlo runs where you pick a bunch of random situations, throw them in, roll them around, and you start to plot graphs and say, well, here are some samples. And what you always worry about is that somewhere between your samples, there's a point of instability that you don't know about yet, but it will pop up later. And so those are the kinds of things, and you, you start deviating, and uh, some of it is best described as uh, um, you're on a, a, a tennis court, and you get a ball, and you throw it, and wherever it lands, you use those conditions in at the front to see what happens, and you randomly pick these. And it's just, for an engineer, it's nerve-wracking, because you, you, you can be working on not just mission-critical, uh, but life-critical applications. And the last thing you want to have is a bad situation because you missed a, a critical issue. So the top one is simple, singular, linear. Almost always you can fully characterize uh, and test it. This thing, in general, you cannot test it. So you have to do other things. And so uh, just to be clear, the ST, the signal in, is just the stimulus. Uh, the HT is whatever that 
is an operator. This could be anything from a simple uh, low-pass filter, high-pass filter, to a computational in, uh, machine. It could be an artificial intelligence machine and the output uh, OT over there. And uh, let me just uh, get to this one. In general, none of these things are true. Um, and we are actually flying blind. And uh, these are topics of, of uh, worry and study. So there are lots of PhD possibilities in here for, for people who uh, want to take on a, a difficult uh, task. So we've got lots of uh, unknowns. Um, here are some things that are sort of obvious. Uh, first of all, uh, we are the only species that optimise. Mother Nature optimises nothing. Once she's got something to be good enough, she stops. Uh, if you are top dog predator, your evolution ceases. There is no further purpose in changing. But should another predator come along, or um, the um, species you live off get smarter, then your evolution may well kick off again and you will smarten up a bit more. But sh Mother Nature is a least energy animal. She puts in least amount of energy effort to get a reasonable result. Um, we, on the other hand, optimize the heck out of things. And I keep going around companies and saying, please, uh, just back off on the optimization. Uh, the, the economists, the accountants, just love it. Squeeze, 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 get rid of people, make things more and more and more efficient. One guy gets the flu, the company stops. They build very brittle entities. And uh, Mother Nature survives by virtue of her inefficiency. Your car is so reliable because of its inefficiency. Once you, you don't want efficiency in the power supply system, the electricity supply, you want it to be a little bit inefficient, please. Otherwise, it'll get very brittle. You, if you get a, a voltage surge, then uh, it will take you out. So um, these cells uh, individually um, are like little factories, the miracles of chemistry. But uh, the complexity is not uh, all that great. Um, but these same cells uh, become strands of DNA and RNA and finishes up with us. So I have a theory for you, uh, kind of a funny theory, but I think uh, DNA is quite smart. Uh, a long time ago it decided that evolution was so slow it had better do something about it, so it created us. And now we're in there twiddling with the DNA and chugging uh, evolution along a bit, and we are a faster changer of the DNA than Mother Nature. Kind of a joke, but kind of serious, because that's what's happening. We, I'm, I'm intrigued by people's view of animals. Almost none of the animals that you see or are domesticated are in any way natural. They have all been produced. Many of the crops that we now eat are as a result of us modifying them. And it's either been uh, by selective breeding or by selective modification of uh, crops or uh, by direct modification of uh, uh, the DNA. I can't remember a time of so much complexity everywhere and it is now the norm. Uh, nothing now seems to be simple uh, and uh, the benefit of this is there are no longer any computer operators. There are no longer any Xerox machine operators because the interface has been made so simple by putting more complexity in, we've been able to push the people aside and we do it all. So the advantage is we get to use it because we've simplified by taking human complexity out and putting machine complexity in. But sometimes uh, the complexity can be overwhelming and um, people uh, 
lose sight. So we are now aping nature by building evolved systems. Um, artificial intelligence, life, the Internet of Things, Internet security are now evolutionary. And I always say to engineers, perfection is, is uh, the enemy of good enough. You know, uh, I have this uh, euphemism, it's called the Mark 27 Spitfire. We've got the Mark 1, it flies, the enemies come in, hang some guns on it and get it off the deck. Don't tell me you can build a better one in two years time because the war will be over. And so in a competitive market, that is what is happening. You get a product and once it's good enough to go to market, you get it out there to try and establish uh, the sales and the support and uh, a loyal following, and then you work on the next one. So that evolution uh, is kind of uh, important. So we have become the test bed for people like Apple and Microsoft. And just a matter of interest, how many of you report software at bugs when they occur, when you're, uh, an app freezes? Please tick the box and report all the things that go wrong with your apps, because it's the only way it's going to get fixed if they have a flood of not complaints, but reports that say, this is the point at which it broke. Then you can correlate all of, and then you can find where the problem is. But if you're looking at 20 million lines of code, just for one app, it's a tough call to be able to find that one line or that full stop that's missing or whatever it is that's, uh, that's killing things. Um, this is a fairly good guide. Uh, the customers always want the earth but you usually find that if you can hit 80% of what they want in budget and on time, they'll be very pleased. And that takes about 20% of the effort. Uh, creating the rest is just uh, extremely expensive. So all I can say about the future is it's going to be fun and there'll be lots of surprises and I feel quite positive about it, but there are some serious challenges uh, for the new engineers coming along. So here's a sort of a uh, management situation that you come into as an engineer, as a scientist, they want you to up the reliability, the quality, the efficiency, the flexibility, the performance and the speed. And by the way, can you get the cost down as well? And these are actually uh, mutually exclusive uh, uh, wants, uh, and you can't do all of these. There is always a cost. And um, people don't understand uh, that the, the functions are not straightforward. But uh, that's the mean time between failure up there, by the way. And um, on these two axes, all of these things can be interrelated. But those curves um, are kind of important. And it's very often difficult to define with any great precision. But I'm going to give you some precise results uh, in a moment. But let's just get this in your mind. If you're making a missile, you want it to sit on the shelf for 25 years and then you need it to perform right first time for five minutes. That's all it's got, to, it's lifetime, it's five minutes, operational lifetime. That's an entirely different beast to building an aircraft which is gonna be used absolutely every day and you do not want it falling out of the sky. That's a different class of engineering altogether. So here's uh, an example. Um, I'll give you the choice. As of tomorrow, you can have a Mercedes E-Class or a BMW 7 Series, or you can have a Formula F1 racing car. The Formula F1 racing car is going to kill you, uh, or you'll kill yourself, but it's not going to work very often. It's highly tuned, it's highly efficient and very brittle. The Mercedes and the BMW are very inefficient. They will last forever. They just keep going. So this is a, one of the best examples I can come up with of why it's important to get the efficiency right. So on a guided missile, you want it to be highly efficient for a very short time. With an aircraft, you want it to be reasonably efficient, but for a very, very long time. And the trade-off of the two is uh, really quite important. So here's how the maths look. And people uh, generally overlook the cost of failure and uh, where we want to be operating is uh, just here. And uh, 
it's not, it's, again, it's not rocket science to derive all the mathematics, um, but it's important to understand that these trades off exist and not just bl blindly uh, build system. So <laughs> I'm just looking around. There's an awful lot of you guys are down here. There's nobody up here in the room, but a lot of you down here and along this line. And, and that, sadly, I'm, I'm over here. I was born a bit too. Young. So um, when I buy some new equipment, I sit it in a corner with the power on and have it running for two or three weeks before I take it on the road. Because if it's going to fail, it's going to be real early. It'll be an infant mortality, it will die early. Once I've got it burnt in, and I've had it on the road for a couple of months, the chances are that it's going to be very, very reliable. The other thing I do, I never buy the latest piece of equipment. I buy one generation back because I'm on the road because you get more infant mortalities on new generation stuff. The, the previous generation, they've got it all lined out and it works perfectly. So being one step back and burning it in gives me a lot of surety that I'm getting reliable, uh, good reliability. Um, I was once at a medical lecture and there was a very eminent Nobel laureate giving the presentation and he said, Duh. you know, the, uh, the first three days of human life are quite, tricky and quite critical and some wag right at the back of the audience shouted out the last three days are not too good either which I thought was a good observation because this this curve is reasonably symmetrical that that's that's the way it is but the wear out phase applies to all machines including us um, and um, we try and get the best res results that we can now I'm going to illustrate uh, something that uh, slightly drives me to distraction, but I go into meetings and people say I need five nines reliability without having any clue what five nines reliability means. So here's a calculation of, uh, of what that means. And uh, if I have a one second outage, the mean time between failure has got to be nearly 11 and a half years. So if you had a car that was five nines reliable, so it, it, it was very high reliability, very low chance of it failing indeed, you be, should be able to run it for about 11 years and then you've, when it does go wrong, you've got to fix it in a second. That number, by the way, everybody's forgotten, came out of the electromechanical telephone exchanges of about 70 years ago. And now people apply it to things where you can't possibly achieve it. So um, you have to start thinking, if you're going to go for these kinds of numbers, how are you going to achieve it? So if you visit a server farm, uh, you will find um, a duplication, at least, of all the equipment. There will be power supplies batteries on the bottom of each rack. Um, there will be batteries for the building. There'll be standby generators. Um, and then there is a crossover because you have to look out for things like common mode failure. The single biggest common mode failure is the human being who starts fiddling with it. The next biggest single mode failure is the power supply. So you get all of this duplication of equipment all run off the same power supply, power supply goes down, bingo, whole system goes. So from a systems point of view, you've got to have at least duplication or triplication of the power and you interleave them so that uh, there is not no one power su system supplying any one piece of equipment and that's how you do it. Um, if you're building a server farm, you have to be 25 miles away from an airport. And not under the flight path. And not under the flight path, yes sir. So here's uh, one uh, survival strategy, uh, and that is the hot standby. You have uh, uh, working systems and you have uh, a standby, and when part of the system goes down, you bring in the standby so you can fix uh, the problem. And um, that has been used a lot, but there are now far superior uh, ways of uh, achieving high reliability. By the way, um, it's worth having a look at the very simple mathematics of uh, failure analysis. And my only comment on this is, this is all averages, and averages never tell you anything. 
you need to know what the probability distribution is before you can say anything uh, remotely accurate or meaningful uh, on, on the reliability. So here's a, a failure mode I like. Uh, it's graceful. Uh, this guy is uh, more or less gliding in, both engines on fire. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, he puts it down rather well. And uh, everybody's uh, just itching to get the rafts out and leap out. Uh, hopefully he's dumped uh, the vast majority of the fuel. But that is a graceful failure. That is uh, synonymous with our old analog systems. By and large, all our analog systems would die like that. They, you, you could actually see and hear them gradually degrading. Um, unfortunately, uh, our digital systems are the uh, antithesis. Uh, everything's fine and dandy, and then, oops, there's a sudden failure. You don't see it coming, and it is just quick. Um, and so part of my life has been trying to find the portents of disaster in time to do something about the accident happening, whatever it be. Um, so uh, he got out on, on, on this occasion. Uh, this one's even worse. He's just got outside with a bang. I don't know what the failure mechanism was, but it took him by surprise. So let me, uh, let me tell you one that I actually engineered. Um, when um, there's an optical fiber in the ground and it's carrying uh, lots of gigabits of information, somebody comes along with a backhoe digger, grabs it and starts pulling. As soon as they start pulling, and you've got to think of the time it takes a digger, it's seconds, the microbending on the fiber pushes the loss up and what you see at the receiver is a quick rise in the error rate and a quick rise in the, in the packet loss. And so what you can do is switch over to a circuit that goes geographically around that area. Uh, that is done on undersea cables uh, in the, uh, uh, the English Channel because what we get there is um, oil tanker captains in a storm will drop their anchor and drag it across the seabed to stabilize the ship and they will just chop one cable after another right down as they go. And so uh, it causes a heck of a lot of panic but it gives you um, a portent that something is going to happen. Because once you see one cable go and you've shifted the traffic, you start to plot where the ship is and start uploading the others and you might miss one and then you put it all back. And so there's this shuffling all the, all the while. Um, another system that I actually developed was, you have to think about this, um, is um, if you've got traffic going both ways on an Atlantic fiber and somebody chops it, you can actually define where that chop is to within one bit by counting the bits coming out. So the way to think of that is, supposing you had a tunnel with two trains going through and you stood there with an ax and you chopped with an ax, the mathematics of predicting where that ax went is trivial because all you've got to do is count the coaches on both. It's ever so easy to do. And so those are the kind of techniques I've got in use, uh, involved in doing, but we need m much more uh, for our computing engines and for our really complex systems. Those are essentially quite simple. So this is a, a sort of to-do list I put together this afternoon of the, or an, a wish list of the stuff we need to get sorted in systems before we are anything like happy um, about this digital domain. So this is the engineering worry. This is the, the systems level uh, thinking and uh, it is a challenge. So at uh, this point, I thought I'd show you a real system design for a couple of minutes because it's sort of fun. Here is the problem I was presented with. Um, we're going to detect where snipers are uh, by using microphones. Uh, it's already been done several times. Commercial systems are available. And this is about today's uh, uh, performance. Uh, you can detect where they are 150, 200 meters. There's a cone of uncertainty about three to five degrees, which is not very accurate. But hey, you're just going to put a shell in there and take that floor out. So that's accurate enough. And the big problem is uh, the ambient noise is huge. Um, so this is like um, me trying to talk to you and have a conversation while everybody else is shouting or in a football crowd. 
I can't, I can't extract uh, your voice. We can't have a conversation. So it's on that uh, sort of a scale. So here's a commercial system, a truck, and at some point, this is an array of microphones. You're effectively triangulating over 360 degrees and saying, um, in bearing and azimuth, where the sniper is. Um, and it works, except uh, when there is a lot of noise. So um, what I'm going to uh, demonstrate, uh, this is the, um, the sniper shot, which I'll give you a sounding of in a minute. It comes hurtling into a microphone. Um, it's easy if there's no noise, but if the noise is going on there, you have to put noise filtering in and then you use digital signal processing and uh, you, you then look at the phase of arrival on the microphones and you calculate where the uh, sniper is. Uh, and that's basically it. But um, what is actually happening is the, uh, the dynamic range of the microphone is being absolutely grounded. It's like you trying to talk to somebody um, on a telephone uh, with uh, a loud hailer right at the side of you. The, the diaphragm, the, re the responsiveness is taken over by uh, that sound and you are just wiped out. So um, what I came up with was uh, a filter that is an acoustic filter. You may or may not know, but the exhaust on your car is a very carefully designed and crafted filter. It's not, it's a silencer, but it's actually a filter. It's a tuned resonant cavity is what it is. And so this filter is a series of tuned resonant cavities, pretty much like um, some musical instruments. Uh, and it, and the, the way it's constructed and designed is pretty much like a, uh, a microwave filter because despite the frequency being different, the wavelength is identical because there's a million to one ratio uh, between the speed of radio and the speed of uh, sound. It so uh, sounds about 300 meters uh, per second. Uh, wireless waves are about 300 million meters per second. Ergo, you, you finish up with the same uh, uh, wavelength. So um, here's uh, a couple of filters. Um, you can see we've got an isolation here of um, 20, 25 dBs. Uh, gradually, we got much better at it. I can't show you the final result, but this is actually the naked microphone uh, response. And, uh, and that's how an array looked. So uh, the actual uh, microphone inserts are looking in there. The sound comes in this way, and it, the sound oscillates in some cavities and hits the, uh, the microphone, and you get the f filtered results. That's kind of fun to do. So that's a little bit of detail. And so this is the machine gun background noise. So you have to imagine in a war situation, you've got people shouting, screaming, guns going off, hand grenades, machine guns all the time. And you're trying to find a sniper in that mayhem. So that, that is the difficulty. That's a, a machine gun going there. Let me just see if I can uh, put the sound up because. I do like this control. That might be a bit better. Let's just try that again. Now that's difficult if I try and talk to you. And believe me, if you're at the side of a machine gun, it's much worse. Absolutely deafening. This is the sniper. Okay, pretty cool. <coughs> Unless you're at the other end. <coughs> and, and you can see the, uh, the time transient and you can see uh, the frequency domain. So uh, the filters, um, we rejected all but the key part of the uh, spectrum uh, that we needed. Uh, and it, it meant that it sounds uh, different. So you put the filter in and uh, we're getting rid of a huge amount of the high frequency noise. So after filtering, you wouldn't expect this to be anything like a, you'd expect it to be more of a boom. And that's exactly what it is. 
So um, you're going to have to listen really carefully because this is a very dull thud underneath the machine gun and it's only just perceptible to the human ear and then I'll show you how we recover it. Okay, it's very hard to detect. There's a little bump there, I don't know if you heard the little bump. That's it, after it's been filtered. And so, uh, we run an autocorrelation on that and it sticks out like a sore thumb. Bingo. Really great. So we were able to effectively exceed the range of the existing system even when we got a very noisy background. Um, fairly typical of an engineering project, there was no real specification for this one, apart from the fact we've got a difficulty, can you see what you can do? And, uh, and, and that was the outcome. So, our challenges are principally ones of non-linearity, uh, uncertainty, not knowing, and not having sufficient tools. Despite all of that, uh, the systems we're making are quite remarkable. Um, people are now able to detect things. Uh, we have sensors that are 10 times more sensitive than a dog's nose. They can detect cancer in people. We can move singular atoms around. And um, I, I think it's sort of fairly miraculous. But the systems, um, if we could understand them more, we could do even more, okay? So we've got time for questions or, or any thoughts. Everybody's looking very slightly stunned. Is anybody here who is or has been a systems engineer? Oh, there are a few of us, okay. My interest is in uh, how systems fail um, because the concept of a, a graceful Graceful degradation is fine so long as it uh, so long as it works. The problem is, how do you identify the point at which uh, it becomes extinct? It's a great question, and the the answer is <coughs> it was relatively simple for analog systems. It's a lot more more complex for uh, digital systems, and we've sorted it out for a few system types, but we don't have any general rules. So let me explain to you some of the things that have been done that are a bit unusual. On a digital system, it turns out that if you monitor the uh, power supply line, uh, very often you can detect things that are happening. So the noise on the power supply line tells you something weird is happening. Um, you can also look at the spectrum of the machine and you can see differences pop in. So weirdly, on a digital system, you can look at the frequency domain and you can see ab abnormal behavior. Um, um, beyond that, there are things <coughs> like a, uh, I would call uh, uh, <coughs> the, the golden brick reference where you have a series of system tests that are reference tests and you say if the system performs in between these bounds it's alright, if it starts to go outside something wrong is happening, but it's all very woolly. Uh, I'm not entirely happy about it. Um, because we've got this problem writ large um, with um, security, where b systems start to behave strangely, and detecting <coughs> that is sort of important. Um, and what we've got is quite crude, um, but some of it works. Uh, and um, there's a disparity between our, um, our exponential development of the new and the rate at which we're trying to catch up to have the things that we really want as engineers. It's a slight worry. That's where we are. Any other questions, folks? Isn't it better to keep with very there's simple the systems then? Put Sorry, there's a, there's a microphone here. Yeah. Isn't it better to have, um, to keep systems very simple and then put them together? Is it in uh, if only. It's not if, <coughs> if only we could do that. Um, if you could tell me how to simplify 
systems, I'd be delighted to do if, it. If, if, you, if you take um, humans, for instance, we start from simple cells and it's kind of... Yep. Well, that's what, that's what, that is what is, I mean, the evolutionary systems that we're building is doing that very rapidly, they get complex. Um, the top-down complexity uh, is uh, sometimes not excusable. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, because in the West we've got lots and lots of cheap hardware, uh, people tend to be a little less tidy with their, their code than, say, uh, the Russians are, who uh, don't quite have the same kind of access to uh, the hardware, their software code tends to be more efficient and, and a lot less uh, stray. It's, it's quite tidy and, and I, I, I can drink to that. But there's been such a rush to do things. Uh, we have people who are sort of failed history graduates who are now writing software. So people without a clue about systems or even tidiness uh, are writing software. And actually <clears throat> rushing to a keyboard is a poor excuse for, th uh, for not thinking. You know, I mean, you, if you think about what you're going to do and what you're going to code and how you're going to do it, you generally finish up with tighter code. But the approach seems to be just to close it together. Does it work? That'll do. And it's very inefficient. Yeah. May I ask sure. Yeah. Um, you may want to leave this on. It is on. You may want to leave this uh, for the artificial intelligence talk. Um, how do you test a system which includes um, uh, machine learning? Because uh, you mentioned it earlier, there's, uh, we don't know how to test these things. I certainly don't. No, <coughs> I, my, my, my thoughts on this, and uh, sometimes I'm a bit on my own, um, I rather like it when machines solve problems by way, in, in ways that we do not understand. Um, we have plenty of human beings and uh, they, uh, they do all kinds of things. So far the machines have not been pernicious uh, or nasty, they, they just solve the problem. The fact that we don't understand it doesn't worry me too much, we, uh, providing they get a, a good answer. Um, so my uh, my, fav my favorite example was <coughs> working on facial recognition uh, with, with uh, regard to the, uh, the Vice Squad. Um, <coughs> we developed some software for recognizing men and women. And it, it was just a simple um, uh, neural network system and you put loads of photographs of women in and loads of photographs of men in and then you say, what's this one? And it kept getting it right. And uh, you and I would recognize masculinity and femininity very easily. But the machine was looking for lipstick and mascara and whiskers. And that's how it made its decision, which is perfectly valid. But very often <clears throat> when you develop one of these networks, you find that the, the way they solve problems is really, really different to us. They think in an entirely different way, which is really quite good. When it gets really, really complicated, is when you don't get a very simple AI system with uh, one method, but you get a complex AI system that's got nearly 500 different techniques in it for deciding. And that is way beyond our ability. So here's uh, uh, something that's quite obvious. <clears throat> for those people who think that we are going to decode the human brain using this, there is a big shock coming. It's fundamentally impossible to decode the human brain using the human brain. Um, and and uh, we, we need the machine help to do that. So uh, my, my favorite difficult problem is protein folding. Uh, we, we have uh, not a chance. The genome, we might have decoded the genome with uh, every human being working on it, on the planet working on it for... Uh, 24 hours a day for 50 years, we might have got it right. Um, and you could understand how it was doing it, but the protein folding is orders of magnitude more complex. And what's really bugging me is where we need to get to is the communication between protein and genome, because that is the seat of the vast majority of human ailments. And if we can get to that point, we will be able to actually, my guess, actually, decide what cancer really is. I think it's a communication error.
between genome and protein, is my guess. So it, it's sort of uh, how long do we uh, have to wait to do that? Um, uh, you know, every uh, that uh, mobile phone there is 20 times more powerful than the Cray 2 supercomputer. And in 10 years, it'll be 1,000 times more powerful again, and so on. And uh, my guess is uh, the protein folding is probably going to take us another 15 or 20 years, and the communication problem, which is much more complex than the protein folding, will probably take us a, another 15 or 20 years after that. Um, by which time we'll be exterminated by the AI. Maybe. Well, <coughs> possibly, uh, or alternatively, we will be saved from our own stupidity. Uh, I don't see any AI that comes close to the human stupidity that we now see, um, by a long way. It is quite inert. Um, it is not AI's fault that we have taught it to go out and hunt down and kill people. But it would say that to save the planet, get rid of humans, wouldn't it? I don't know. The science fiction... Um, here's the big problem with AI, and we're not there yet for a while. It will not be uh, really uh, sentient until it's got self-awareness. And it has not got self-awareness. Once it gets self-awareness, the biggest component of intelligence is the sensory system, period. It's not the processing power, it's not the memory, it's the sensory system. And so once uh, the AI gets all the sensors it needs, and it's going to have better and more sensors than we've got, then it will start to become very interesting. But there isn't a single life form, uh, apart from some bacteria and viruses, that are inherently nasty. Uh, and we're not quite sure why they are, but it could be just a clean-up mechanism to uh, prune the human race of it. Yeah. Um, and the, the answer is, we don't know. Mm. But I always say to people this, show me the technology you are willing to do without. Show me the technology you would like to get rid of. You know, the, 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 there's the I don't like technology group, and you say to them, well, let's close down all the MRI scanners the x-ray machines, let's switch off the mobile phones, let's take computers away, let's put everybody back on the farm, let's cut out all the... This luxury we're enjoying this, me this evening would have been impossible 100 years ago because we would have been so clapped out, having worked 16 hours down a coal mine or on a farm, we wouldn't have been doing this, we wouldn't have had any education. The only reason that we have an education that allows us to do this is the fact that there was an industrial revolution and it was to the advantage of that revolution to have an educated population. There was no, it wasn't altruistic to educate the population. But then isn't the problem now that we're educating everybody, but then no one's going to have any jobs because we're all... No, 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 quite the reverse. No? If that was true, today we have 750,000 vacancies for high-tech people in the UK. We have 200,000 vacancies for data analysts. Mm. You cannot find anybody to paint your house, fix your plumbing, do your electrics or build your house. Go outside, every coffee shop, every hotel, every builder's yard, all people from different countries. A lot of the drivers on the road, they're not English. We've got 4.3% unemployment, Germany's got 3.9% and America's got 4.1% unemployment. Gee, it's difficult to get below those figures because that is the long-term unemployed on the basis of uh, ailments or a total unwillingness to work, whatever it is. But it's very difficult for society to get below that. And if what you say was true, we'd all be out of work already. But this is the, the, the approaching apocalypse, isn't it? This, I mean, no. Apocalypse, you, really. out, you tell me how we are going to support seven, just over seven billion people on the planet without the technology. You can't. I I'm not saying get rid of the technology. What I'm saying is if the technology gets too good, People, need to work. people have had this argument for the last 100 years and my, my approach is bringing it on. I mean, it'll be fun. No, no, I mean, they're alre they've already whooped, whooped us at uh, poker and chess and go and table tennis and all those kinds of things. My, my view of them is very simple. I'd, you know, there's a screw. I'll, I'll put this screw in with my finger now or pass me a screwdriver. Screwdriver is a muscle amplifier. AI is an intellect amplifier, period. I can't, I can't do any more with this grey matter. I need some augmentation, <coughs> please. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, it's going to be fun to play with. I can't even read all the stuff I'm supposed to read, sir. So.
Yeah. I'm kind of interested by one of the things that you mentioned earlier on, which is um, when you get a significant number of inputs and outputs on a system, then it becomes, in effect, you, impossible to test. Yeah. Um, and this raises some interesting kind of philosophical things. As you said, you know, sort of there's always the, the question, it becomes probabilistic whether there are any unknown behaviours in between the behaviours you have tested. Yep. Um, and that's, that becomes um, multiplied enormously. If you take the example of your missile, which sits on the shelf for 25 years and then has a five minute lifespan, yep. in that intervening 25 years, um, a potentially infinite number of things can have happened to go wrong, which yep. means this system is in a completely unknown state. Um, so it, it seems that there's a, there's a, we're edging towards a sort of a philosophical point about the, you know, sort of the general unknowability yep. uh, of this. And so you end up, and it might as well be illusory, you know, sort of you are, you are taking as a point of faith that this missile will work when you launch it. Can I give you, you a concrete example? Yeah. You're old enough to remember the U-2 incident and Gary Powers. Um, I'll have the numbers slightly wrong, but they're in the general ballpark. Uh, as I recall, the Russians uh, tried to launch eight missiles. Um, about five of them failed, three went, and one of them hit him. And that is exactly that problem. So the Russian approach is to have tons of stuff that's fairly uh, unreliable, and the Western approach is to have not so much, but highly reliable stuff. Yeah, I mean, one of my, my personal favourite things, again, it's from the Falklands conflict. Um, I, well, I'm old enough to remember that. I was yeah. actually in the Navy at the time as well. Um, but um, the, the, the Navy made a lot of design changes following the Falklands conflict because yep. they learned an awful lot, having not really been involved in much by way of conflict uh, in the preceding 20, 30 years. Um, so, but one of the things was they built a lot of ships around a missile system called Sea Slug, yep. um, which was a huge and... Um, somewhat agricultural missile system that required two thirds of a ship to, uh, to store the missiles. I thought it was an unfortunate name myself. It, well, yes. <laughs> um, but the, the interesting thing is when they started to use these missiles, having had them on these ships for 20 plus years um, in the Falklands conflict, they found that they were actually no use at all for the purpose they'd been designed for. They were packed with explosive, but it just basically didn't work. So they ended up finding they were far more useful for the kinetic energy they had and they yep. would launch these great big lumps of metal and they would crash a hole into a runway or something and that was about all this mis ex you know, huge expensive yeah. missile system was useful for. I, I remember being at a defence conference uh, just after the Gulf War and the Americans had been dropping in 500 pound bombs to hit a weapons platform that had been put in a, a suburban area and they were killing lots of people and uh, the British came along and the Americans were hailing the genius of the, the British because um, <laughs> the British took the warhead off and put 500 pounds of concrete on the end so some guy sat in a tank down at High Street <laughs> a back street somewhere in Baghdad out of the sky at 700 miles an hour comes a ton of concrete there's just a hole in the ground and only he, he got killed and uh, I made the observation that, you know, we should really check that we'd not run out of explosives. I mean, that's the, it, was, it was the ultimate sort of uh, weapon. There's, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no stopping the amount of innovation we'll apply to hurting each other. I, think, I find it a great shame. I'm much more interested in what can, what can we do with this stuff and how do we make it safe and how can we benefit from it? Okay, I think we're... Uh, about there on time. Have we got to another one for you? Yeah, okay, by all means. Yeah. Peter, possibly at the other end of the spectrum from artificial intelligence, politicians and the press, yeah. how are they going to help us as a society deal with this um, increasing trend towards complexity when the kind of the world they live in seems to revolve around I have a simple answer to these things that we assume are simple problems in the world. I think we have uh, a major problem. Um, it, it, we are facing a tidal wave of ignorance that is one, uh, fashionable, and two, very often beneficial to people. Uh, people, a population at large, um, seem to celebrate ignorance and they make celebrities of the complete fools. And um, if you have uh, any knowledge, experience, or wisdom to proffer, uh, it is, tends to be denigrated, uh, which I find really quite worrying. Uh, people are no longer 
willing to listen. Um, you know, they feel that uh, <clears throat> somehow their ignorance is on the same level of credibility as your uh, understanding, education, knowledge, experience, which is really worrying. That is not true, by the way, outside the Western world. If you go into Southeast Asia, there's an inversion of uh, that quality. And um, I'm not sure what we do about it, but as our, one of our politicians said recently, we've had enough of experts. He's I thought, actually quoted in Tom Nichols' book, uh, which uh, covers that whole uh, whole theme, yep. uh, published uh, sometime last year. I'll send you the link. I once uh, remember a cartoon, it was uh, John Major, and he made the, the comment that uh, he didn't really think uh, ed <coughs> university education was necessary. He found he'd got through life uh, quite well by just using common sense. And the scene of the cartoon was an operating theatre, and the surgeon is stood there with a scalpel in his hand, and then he said, um, uh, uh, now who here has got the common sense to do this uh, uh, quad heart uh, bypass? <laughs> I mean, I find it such a, a, an absurd situation, it's difficult to understand. And uh, the present uh, situation in the United States is, I hope, just the extreme. It would be hard to imagine something more extreme, but you see traits of it right across the Western world. It's very, very worrying. And, and the manifestation of it in terms of um, racial uh, hatred or um, hatred of immigrants or any other people, I think really is very worrying. The, the intolerance on some abstract basis, I don't, I don't get. I, I really don't understand it. But I would suggest, I would suggest, in the United States case, I would strongly suggest that if you neglect the education of the people, that's perhaps what you get. The list, the list is enormous. Uh, you know, tonight uh, there's been no graph theory. It's just a huge amount of stuff. And um, uh, to go back to my opening words, I'm trying to get pe people to be able to get to the first page and proceed with confidence that they can understand this stuff. And um, what we're talking about is what's going to be the courses we're going to run and uh, they're starting to emerge so um, it looks like we're going to be doing quite a bit on security now if we if we get a systems course up and running i will throw uh, everything in uh, to the systems course and uh, in, in one and a half hours or so information theory i can get everybody to first base but that's the starting point, um, but I can't squeeze everything in, it's just not humanly possible. Okay, right. thank you for coming, I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. Can I offer our thanks? Oh, it's a pleasure, thank you.